The circuit Gilles Villeneuve in Montreal has seen a lot of drama over the years, and not least in 1989 when Thierry Boutsen won his first Grand Prix for Williams. We had a very difficult race because we, I think we came in to the pits four or five times to change tyres, going from wet to slicks to wet to slicks, but it was a great moment. First one is always the most difficult, but once you've done it, you know how it works, and then everybody says that the second one is a little bit easier, and then the more you win, the more it becomes a standard. Thierry enjoyed a 10-year Formula One career in which he drove 164 races. He never had the best car, yet he won three Grand Prix and took 15 podiums. And the last of those wins saw him beat none other than Ayrton Senna. Not many people have been able to, or can say that they've beaten Ayrton Senna on, on, a, on a one-to-one fight. Huh? I'm one of the few, I'm very proud of it. Very, very proud of it. From Belgium, Brussels, Thierry Boutsen, who has driven an immaculate race, wins his third Grand Prix. They are great friends, Thierry Boutsen and Ayrton Senna, and Senna realises that he's been fairly and squarely beaten by his friends. He said, uh, if you do that again, I will hit you. <laughs> Welcome everyone to F1 Beyond the Grid with me, Tom Clarkson. It's a real treat to have Thierry Bootson on the show this week because he's a very rare breed of racing driver. Someone who was very quick behind the wheel of a car, who went on to achieve great things after his Formula One career. And in Thierry's case, that was setting up Bootson Aviation since when he hasn't looked back. Over the next hour, you're going to hear him discuss his wins, his love of engineering, his friendship with Ayrton Senna, his life as a businessman, and much, much more. He's an intelligent and articulate man with a great story to tell. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Thierry, it is wonderful to have you on the show. Thank you very much for your time. 10 seasons in Formula One, 164 races, three wins, 15 podiums. How do you sum it all up? It's a very good question. When you do a race, whether it's in Formula Four or in Formula One or whatever, you always think about the next one that's coming up the next Sunday. You immediately forget the one that's, uh, that has passed. So you go from race to race. And when you retire from racing, it takes a little bit of time to to really think about all these races that you've immediately forgotten and they slowly come back into your memory. And uh, to be honest, my very first race in Formula One was probably the most important for me because I could prove then that I was good enough to be in Formula One and to drive a Formula One car. I qualified well in Spa and I was, uh, unfortunately, I had a problem with the car and I had suspension that, uh, suspension bearing that, that broke. But otherwise, I could see that I was at the level required to be in Formula One. So that was, for me, very, very important. But I think it's it's more, for me, the fact that being there for 10 years, 164 Grand Prix, and be able to win races, uh, although I never had the best car from the of, of the field. I mean, my clients were winning absolutely everything. They were finishing one, two at every race. So so I was I was very happy to be able sometimes to, to pick one out of that and, and win it. Uh, not many people have done it. So, so I'm very proud of the whole career and very pleased with what I've done in Formula One, yes. And when you reflect on your career and you start thinking again about you as a racing driver, what were your greatest strengths behind the wheel? Well, I studied engineering and that helped me a lot in understanding how a car is working, you know, what to do to make it better. I had long, long, long meetings all my career along with engineers to to uh, to develop ideas and to try to make the car better all the way along. So so it was it was great to have this background and to be able to use it uh, whenever it was uh, necessary. And uh, so that that was a big part of my uh, my history in Formula One and in racing in general. You must have forged some really close bonds with your engineers. By far. I would say Rory Byrne. He was a genius. He was really a genius. He had his own ideas on how a car would work. And I was in complete agreement with him. That was, uh, for me, uh, two years that, were, that I have enjoyed so much working with a brilliant man like this and having the same ideas and be able to develop the car together. I really enjoyed every minute of, of working with him. And that 1988 Benetton, the B188, was a very successful year. I took six podiums. 
disqualified in Spa because the, the, the fuel was 15 uh, days out and the optimum rate was 0.1 of a percent higher than, uh, than the maximum uh, allowed. So there is a regulation we had to forbid to that. And we didn't know it before the race. It was the fuel, the same fuel that was used in the race before, and we used it in Spa. And before it was legal, and in Spa it was not legal anymore because of the time in between the two. Anyway, uh, the car was just brilliant, brilliant. It was reliable. It was, uh, I would not say, the easiest car to drive. I think the 1987 Benetton was a little bit easier to drive. It was a bit more fun to drive because of the turbo, because of uh, the way it was uh, conceived and built. I slightly preferred. To, to drive the 1987 Benetton than the 88, but the 88 was, was such a good car and it was, uh, it, there was no problem with it. It was an easy car, easy to set up and quick everywhere. And uh, yeah, it, it, it was good, very, very good. You work with Patrick Head at Williams. How different were Patrick and Rory Byrne? You cannot compare the two. How should I say? It's, it's a very, very difficult question because the two men were so different from each other. Benetton was also a young team. So we were also taking more risks in, in developing the car. We were a little bit more extravagant in things that uh, we put on the car. And, and the times were also different because the, 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 the Williams that I drove, the first one was just an evolution of the car that was uh, run with a Judd engine before. We had the Renault engine, but the Renault engine and that FW12 were not well fitted together. Then came the Renault, the, the FW13 and then the 13B, and that car was not a very good car. It was only working at some places like Hungary, like Imola, but otherwise uh, it was way behind the other cars. Uh, and Patrick was, was not having a very good time at that time, and he was uh, trying to find solution. He was much more worried about the about how how the next car would be. And uh, of course, putting some of the mistakes on the driver's responsibility, which which was never, ever the case at Benetton. Whatever, something went wrong, and they were analyzing it, and then the car was always taking the blame on, on everything. So that was a little bit different at Williams. The, the way the team was run also by Frank was, uh, was very different. I mean, it was pure business. Benetton, it was pure racing. That, that was, that's how you can, you can make the difference. I always think Patrick was very unforgiving towards his drivers. I mean, he came out with that wonderful quote once, drivers are like light bulbs. You can take one out and put another one in. Yeah, but that's not very nice. <laughs> no, it's not very nice. It's not very nice because we are, we are doing the work. We are taking the, when we were, I'm, 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 <laughs> driver in general, uh, are taking the risk. They have their own character. They live in, an, in a certain atmosphere psychologically sometimes very very difficult to cope with all the all the all the stuff which is around and uh, there's a lot of pressure from the sponsors from uh, from the people around I, I i disagree totally with that tell us a little bit more about the relationship between you as a driver and your engineers the ones you were working closest with in that let's say the car has a particular problem how would you set about solving it would you work together with your engineer thinking of a solution or was your job as the driver just to report what the car was doing on track? Um, I think what you've just told me about uh, reporting and then waiting for the engineer to come with an answer is something that I've never, ever thought of. You know, I've always been working with engineer and when I have a problem with the car, I was just telling, I have this, this problem, this problem, and I think the solution is this and this and this. And then we were working together and trying to optimize it and find a solution. I think today, with all the computers involved in, in developing the car, it is when the, 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 the driver is reporting the problem and then the computer gives a solution or the engineer with the computer to give a solution. But it's not, not anymore like it used to be where the driver was very much involved in setting up the car. And uh, we had no computer at that time. I mean, the, 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 when, I, when I started racing Formula 1 in 1983, uh, computers and laptops did not exist. So, so it was a totally different uh, era of, of, of racing. It's only in the beginning of the 90s that we had uh, computer aid and uh, the telemetry that started to come. And, and, and yes, then, then the, the, the engineers and the, the, the whole uh, IT started to play again. Let's talk about the wins now. Um, first, Canada 89, you're in the Williams FW12. It's wet. You're sixth on the grid, directly behind the Ferraris. 
What were your expectations coming into that race? I had a very good feeling going to Canada. And when I was on the track there, I didn't feel that the driver and car were working very well together. I could not achieve what I wanted to achieve during qualifying. I had something missing there. I knew that you know, on the race uh, condition, the car was very good. But in qualifying, I was a little bit upset with the time that I did. The car was capable of more and I was capable of more, but both together we didn't produce. So I was a little bit upset with that. Uh, but this being said, when it started to rain in there, I was very happy because <laughs> I could compensate with a lot of problems that the car had, a lot of uh, little details that did, did not work very well in the handling. I could compensate that in the wet uh, uh, using my skills and, and the, the, the positive uh, points of the car handling in the wet. So it worked well. The car was, was very competitive. We had a very difficult race because we, I think we came in to the pits four or five times to change tyres, going from wet to slicks to wet to slicks. Let's break it down. I'd like to start by talking about the Renault engine in those conditions. Renault had just come back into Formula One as, as a full-on manufacturer. You've already said that the engine was slightly shoehorned into the back of that car. It was actually the sort of the, the Judd engine from the previous year. How good was that engine? How drivable was it in the wet? The, the first impression I had with the engine was that the, the sound was fantastic. I mean, I really loved the sound of that engine. It was something really magic, you know? The, the, the qualities went together with the sound, <laughs> if you see what I mean. I mean, the, the, the engine was very smooth, almost no vibrations, uh, good power range. I mean, you could drive quite low in the revs and accelerate all the way up to 13, 13, 5, 13, 6 on the in this These days were the first engine. So, so no, it was a very good engine. Very smooth, quite a lot of power. Maybe not as much as uh, competitors like, like Honda, but uh, in the top league, for sure, on the top league and uh, in constant development. I mean, Every second race or third race, we had a little bit of an improvement on the engine side. So, so it was very enjoyable moments being able to, to be part of that. We started with an engine that was really rough at the beginning. But in the end, when we started racing in, in, in Brazil, it was, was pretty good. Yeah. So you have a, a beautiful engine. Sounds great. Very smooth power delivery. You say that the FW12 was a little bit difficult handling wise so i'm gonna say that what really made the difference that day in canada was the man behind the wheel and you were always a genius in the wet and i want to know thank you very much Terry, <laughs> i want to know where this unbelievable skill for the wet the feel that you had came from there's a very quick answer to that you know i used to live in belgium <laughs> And in Belgium, you can practice every day on the roads. You know, it's wet all the time. So, <laughs> so. yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm laughing, but I feel you're being serious. Well, serious, yes, but, but no, no, I'm, I'm laughing. It's uh, when I was 14, 15 years old, I had a, a motorbike, 50cc. And I, it was um, the very first one that I had was a Zundab 50cc. And, I immediately transformed that motorcycle into a trail bike. And uh, instead of going by road to the school, I was going through the woods to the school and, and having obstacles. And I was, I was doing exercising uh, in these difficult conditions. So I had a very, very good uh, practice for the balance and feeling what to do, when to do it, not to go too far. Not to, you know, I practiced that for, for at least four to five years. Uh, every single day and that gave me i think some some intuition how to drive in the wet and i, I really love driving in the wet really really loved it and were you ever tempted to pursue a career on two wheels no no no, no. <laughs> <laughs> i did a couple of races when i think when i was 15 i did a couple of races uh that were uh, organized by some friends like uh, on the race on the go-kart track in uh, nivelle you know the race track in nivelle where the Formula One was held in the 70s. And the go kart track there, and I fell twice, and I didn't want to hurt myself and then jeopardize my Formula One, my, my racing career, in, in my car racing career. So that was it. I did that but as, as a pure test, and then no, not for me. Why not set yourself a new goal this summer? If you've ever regretted not paying more attention in your language classes at school, or you just want to develop a new skill, Babbel can help. With Babbel, you can learn a new language with as little as just 15-minute daily lessons. 
What I love about it is that they design their courses with practical, real-world conversations in mind. They focus on useful vocabulary. You're learning things that you'll actually use in everyday life. And it's all thanks to the fact that their lesson plans are designed by real-life language experts, so you really get that personal touch. They even have tools to help you with your accent and pronunciation. There are 14 different languages to choose from, including German, French, Spanish and Italian. It's available as an app or online, so you can log on and take a lesson whenever and wherever you want, and your progress will be synced across all devices. So you can learn on your schedule at a pace that suits you. Right now, Babbel is offering our listeners six months free with a purchase of a six-month subscription with the promo code GRID. Go to uk.babbel.com slash play and use the promo code GRID for an extra six months free. That's uk.babbel.com forward slash play promo code GRID. So let's take it back to Montreal, 89. As you've said already, the, the track conditions were changing. It was dry. It was wet. How difficult is it when it's like that just to keep on top of the situation? Because so many other drivers didn't. Well, it's part of the, the way you can concentrate. I mean, you really, really need to be focused and concentrated and always be with your head in front of the events, in front of the, what's happening. So when, when it starts raining, you know, a few moments before it, it's going to rain. So uh, you see it coming and you have immediately to adapt yourself to that. As what, what happens most of the time when you're on slicks and it starts raining, people don't slow down enough. It's like what I used to do is to slow down too much and then re-accelerate from there and be, be able to, to uh, manage it. If you don't do that, then you're lost and you go too fast and then you're lost and you, you don't know what to do, where to, where to break. And then, you know, starting from almost from, from zero. In the other way, it's the same. When it's, uh, it's wet and it starts drying, you have to adapt immediately in these uh, uh, drying conditions. And I was, I, I was quite good at it uh, and putting the slicks and it was still, you know, half damp uh, and being be, um, able to take the advantage on, on most of the others. Well, you certainly do that. You win the race. And even now, 30 odd years on, can you still remember how sweet it was to be stood on the top step looking down at your team and your friends? Yes, but I also see pictures from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me this moment. Uh, but it was a great moment, for sure. The first one is always the, the most difficult. But once you've done it, you know how it works. And then everybody says that the second one is a little bit easier. And then the more you win, the more it becomes a standard. Well, except, Terry, I don't think the second one was easier because you go to Australia later that year. Again, treacherous conditions. It was even worse, a lot worse than, than in Canada. Yeah, sure. Uh, but again, I love driving in the wet. And I, had, I thought, there, well, I have a chance to do well there because it's very wet and a lot of people will make mistakes. If I don't make any mistakes, I'm not going to win that race. I was absolutely sure before the start and when drivers stood there not knowing are we going to go in the race are we not going into the race and i said no please 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 let's do the race i want to race i definitely want to race conditions are very difficult extremely difficult but that's what i love you know and you led most of that race in australia so in a way was it a more satisfying win than montreal had been because of course you, you actually took the lead of that race late on when senna had his engine problem the first one, it's true, came a little bit as a surprise, but uh, I, I, I did some catching up during the race and, and came back from, from quite a way behind until the second position when, when he had this problem with the engine. But, uh, you know, the first one, you didn't seem to, to, to remember all these, uh, these hiccups that happened in the race and you win and that's it, you win and you've been the best and the best car and the best team and the best tires, the best of everything. So you won there. The exercise in, her, in, in uh, Adelaide was a little bit different because of these conditions. And I only had myself to fight against uh, and drive really uh, smoothly, properly, and not making a mistake and not even sliding a little bit. Although we didn't see anything going down the straight, I was very careful and, and listening to the engine that was it, not, not the car, but also the engine noise that was in front of me to know if he was the same speed as me, if I was catching him where he was braking, you didn't see anything. You could only see on the side of the road, but nothing in, uh, in front of you. So 
it was pretty pretty uh, dangerous, but mainly difficult. And, and here, the concentration was something that was extremely important, extremely important. It's like you know, I could not allow to blink your eyes during the way down the street because it would have been uh, disastrous. The way you describe that, just listening to the engine note in front of you, really makes it sound unbelievably mad <laughs> when it's like that. Because I, th- I think the current Formula One wouldn't race in those conditions now. No, for sure not. For sure not. But uh, we've been through some times that, that, that we, I mean, you know, do you think today people would drive wing cars with the sliding skirts? No way. You think today people who drive a car with 1,500 horsepower like we did in, in qualifying uh, with these cars in, in the just aluminum chassis? No way. And we've been through that and, and uh, this will never happen again. Safety has changed a lot for, for good reasons and, and, uh, and for, the, for the best of motorsport the, the, that, that has changed. And there's a lot less accidents. A lot of people have died in the past, which is not the case anymore today. So that's all positive. Did you ever question what you were doing as you were getting strapped in in front of that BMW turbo engine in the Arrows? Did you ever think, what am I doing? Am I? (laughs) You're shaking your head at me. (laughs) (laughs) I was there to win. I was there to win. That was it. When we started with the turbo engine, we had uh, 800, 850 horsepower, then 900, then 1,000, 1,000. 1,200, and it was only going up and up and up. And we were thinking, well, we've enjoyed that. I mean, and I'm enjoying that. And it's something that would never happen again. We enjoyed every moment of it. Everybody, everybody it was just so crazy. And so, in a way, so nice to live that. Can you describe a quali lap with that BMW Turbo? I keep talking about the BMW Turbo because I'm thinking that was the one in all of your career that had the most power, right? Well, to be honest, I still don't understand how we could manage that. Uh, it was just incredible. We were in Monaco. This was the most impressive racetrack with this kind of power. Uh, BMW engine had a turbo which was about this big. And in order to get the maximum power, we were just taking the wastegate out and put a big, thick piece of metal to block the, the exhaust from going through the wastegate. Everything was going through the exhaust pipe and giving a lot of boost and, and, and power. This with the turbo lag that was immense in these days because of the big turbo. So we had a big bang when the power was coming. We were going through Saint Devot, the first corner after the, the finish line. The tires were just warm and we had the wheel spin all the way up to the fifth gear going to the casino. So almost all the way up. We had the, the, the car was winging like this, you know, it's too much power. Couldn't change gear fast enough. Exactly. That, that was one of the problems we had. But then going through the racetrack, we were going to the swimming pool and the tires had gone completely. We had blisters like, like this on uh, the tires. So we had this, this kind of power with absolutely no grip anymore. <laughs> so that was a second challenge in the qualifying run. Uh, but it, it was it was it was good fun. It was really really good fun. Very impressive. It's something that people will not live this anymore. Now, win number three. Let's go to the Hungaro Ring now. Uh, it's 1990. Very reminiscent of the late Graham Hill. This boots and drive, tremendous determination, doing all the right things tactically without ever having to go fantastically fast. Other people have been whizzing around behind him to no effect. Bootson has withstood everything. He's held on and it looks as if he's going to, but uh, you never know with Senna. Indeed you do not, and there's a, there's a back marker that up to turn seven out of eleven. I think it's one of the arrows, but Bootson's, it's, uh, it is one of the arrows. It's Michele Alvareto who is in front of Thierry Bootson as he comes down to turn ten on the last lap of the Hungarian Grand Prix, and Ayrton Senna could still do it. They're going past the pit lane now. Bootson needs to keep it good and tight. He is going to win the Hungarian Grand Prix for his third victory, and Thierry Bootson does indeed. Do just that from Belgium, Brussels, Thierry Bootsman, who has driven an immaculate race, wins his third Grand Prix. You had a very good record in Hungary, third in 88 and 89. 
did you go into that race feeling particularly confident? Well, I, I was on pole, and I knew that the car was good at that track. Maybe not the best, and for sure not the best, but good for one qualifying lap. That was that was sure. Although I went very carefully into the qualifying lap, and I did not use the full potential of the tires. I lost a little bit of time to be able to manage the pole position. I was mentally very well prepared because I looked at the result of the year before and I could see that Mansell did the whole race without changing tires. And we had exactly the same tires in 1990 compared to 1989. And I thought, you know, the car is not the best one. So some people are quicker than me and will be quicker than me in the race. But if I can be on pole and start on pole because I have the best engine and the, the best suited engine for that kind of racetrack with a lot of torque, maybe not the maximum power with a lot of torque coming out of the corners. If I'm in the lead in lap one, I will be in the last lap. That I was totally convinced of that unless something happens. And uh, in the race, I thought, well, if I stop, I lose the race because uh, first of all, the team was not prepared, not trained enough to change tires quickly. So I would have lost, I don't know, 10, 15 seconds in the pits, maybe five to 10 seconds more and the teams that were prepared and, and trained for that. So that for me, it was no go. Stopping for tires was absolutely no go for these two reasons. If I'm in the lead, I stay in the lead. That's it. <laughs> Secondly, if I stop, I lose the race. That's for sure. So I took the chance and went all the way up to the end. And in the end, there was no rubber left on the tire. I mean, the, the left rear tire, you could see the thread. I mean, this white uh, thread, that there was no rubber anymore on the tire. I was... Uh, very lucky to, to finish and I uh, don't think I would have done would have been able to do five more laps with the, with the tires and certainly not with the brakes. I had the disc, the, 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 the brake uh, uh, in, in my office, and, you know, it's full of holes. There was no material left on, on, the, on the disc. I was, I was extremely lucky to finish and to finish first. Terry, let's get this straight. You had no brakes. You had no rubber no, on no, your no. tire. I had, I had brakes. But I would have, I mean, they still had very good brakes and they were working very well. But I think one more lap and it would have exploded. But everything was on the limit. And I want yes. to know how you dealt with having that yellow helmet of Ayrton Senna on your gearbox for so much of that race. Describe the intensity of that. He was not there all the time. So when he was not there, I was able to slow down and to, to adapt the pace to the next one and not use 100% of the tires that was the, my main concern was the tires so i was probably driving at 90 92 percent in order to conserve the tires to keep them in good shape all the longest possible time and uh, i mean the, the balance between going slow not too fast and keeping the pressure behind me made me a, as a winner and, but i must say that uh, a, a good part of it is the Renault engine because i had more torque than ayrton coming out of the single corners so there's no way he could have passed me in, 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 in anywhere, unless I made a mistake, of course. Did he stick his nose down the inside at any point? Yes, a couple of times before the end of the race, in the last two, three years before the end, but I shut the door and I saw him coming so I was on the side. And he did not insist too much. I think if he would, if he, he did not want to take any risks, knowing that I absolutely wanted this victory and he wanted the points and the points of a second place were good enough for him, so. So I had a challenge, a good, good challenge, but uh, these circumstances played in my favour. Well, it was a great challenge. And to beat a man like Ayrton Senna in that way, does that make this your most satisfying win in Formula One? Not many people have been able to, or can say that they've beaten Ayrton Senna on, on a one-to-one on -on -one fight. Huh? So I'm one of the few and I'm very proud of it. Very, very proud of it, yes. He beat me many, many times, but at least one time I succeeded. <laughs> what did Senna say to you on the podium? Well, you know, we are, we, we were, I say we are because for me, he's still, still there, he's still with us. But uh, we were very, very good friends. I mean, Ayrton was my best friend in, and probably my, my only real friend in the world of, uh, of Formula One. So, uh, so we had a normal, I would say, friendly chat about, about the race and uh, he said, uh, if you do that again, I mean, if I block him in the demonstrate, if, I, if you do that again, I will hit you. <laughs> As a joke, you know, but... Uh, what was it about Ayrton, do you think, that made you such good friends? Why did you get on so well? Maybe character. Maybe I had a lot of respect for him. He had a lot of respect for me. 
Uh, we got on very well together. And we were uh, playing with the same toys, you know, airplane, helicopters. I like to be with him. He liked to be with us, with, us, with our family, with my first uh, son, uh, Kevin. So we spent quite a lot of time uh, together. In 1984, actually, we had a, a really intense race in Detroit together. We were passing each other all the time and, until I had a problem with the car. And that was the first time that I know who's this guy, you know, Ayrton Senna, never heard of him. <laughs> That's the first time we met after the race, we saw each other, we congratulated each other for, for, the, for the good time that we spent together. Did he confide in you at all, sort of about racing and everything that was going on in his racing life? A little bit, but not much. When we were together, we were not talking about racing too much, except at one stage where he, he wanted to go to Ferrari. Ferrari wanted to have him. And he told me that if he goes to Ferrari, I will go with him to Ferrari. I let him do the, the discussions with, with Ferrari. We, I sat together once with Marco Piccini to, uh, to open this kind of conversation, make sure that uh, I would fit in the team in, at that time. But uh, uh, unfortunately, this didn't happen. He didn't go to Ferrari and I didn't go to Ferrari. I went to Williams instead. How close do you think that got? I have absolutely no idea because we never discussed this, this uh, details of, of this. It was just the fact that he said to me, you know, if I go, you come with me. That's it. So I said, okay, okay good. I was uh, very confident and, and uh, not, I would say the confidentiality in his negotiation with Ferrari were, were more important than, than discussing it with him. So I let him do. And then one day he said to me, sorry, but it's not happening. So keep on going your way and I will go my way. Did you stay close to Senna after your Formula One career ended in 93? Yes. I asked him if he accepted to be the godfather of my second son, Cedric. And uh, we were at Le Castellet and he was testing for Williams the first time, I think. And he said yes to me. Unfortunately, he had the accident a couple of weeks before Cedric was born. So uh, so it never happened. But in, in, in our heart and family and in Cedric's heart also Ayrton is his uh, godfather. And you were a pallbearer at Senna's funeral in, in Sao Paulo. Can you describe the scene there? You know, you, you enter into something which is very different. You enter into kind of a, a black moment where everything is, everybody is sad. And you see all these people, there were millions of people on the streets and, and, uh, and wherever we're going, you know, church and, and, and all that. So, millions of people, you really enter into something, into a different place. And you're just with Ayrton all the time there. You don't see, you don't think, you, there's nothing else existing at the time. It was very, very strong as a feeling, not because he was my best friend, not because, because I've had other, other people uh, uh, who passed away in my life, but uh, it was really something special really something special that I cannot really describe. It was just so deep in, in me and in, in, in most of the people that were there. If we ever started selling Beyond the Grid merchandise, I know exactly who I'd want to turn to to help us do it. Shopify. Shopify makes it simple for anyone to sell anywhere. From in-person point of sale to online through your website and social media channels like TikTok, Facebook and Instagram. So if you've got a small business or a side hustle that you're trying to build, they're the team that you want on your side. And you don't even need any skills in design or coding. With a few easy steps, Shopify will help you tailor your online store and craft the look you're after, find new customers and scale up your small business to turn it into a money-making success. Think of Gymshark or Huel. They're all small businesses that have made it big. And guess what? They are Shopify merchants too. Every minute of every day, a new seller makes their first sale with Shopify. And you can join them. Start selling today with Shopify for free and make that business idea a reality. This is Possibility powered by Shopify. And thanks to their 24-7 support, you can count on help every step of the way. Sign up for a free 14-day trial at shopify.co.uk slash grid, all lowercase. Go to shopify.co.uk slash grid right now to grow your business today. Shopify.co.uk slash grid. What was your own attitude to danger, Thierry? Because, well, outside of Formula One, you had those two 
massive accidents at Le Mans. The first in 81, wasn't it? The second uh, in 99. How did you come to terms with what you were doing? It's, it's something very uh, strange. You start your career as a racing driver. You know that it's a very, it's an extremely dangerous sport. In these years, when I started in 1976, 77, there were people dying every year in Formula One and in all the other series. And that was something that was known and it was kind of accepted. I mean, we knew the risk that we were taking. And as a young guy from, I don't know, 18 to 20, 22 years old, you're really thinking to yourself, you know, okay, I'm doing what I want to do. If I have an accident, if I die, that's it. I would die doing the things that I wanted to do and I would enjoy every minute until, or every second until, until the last one. It's only when I was a little bit older that I started to think about safety and, and the accident of Stefan Belov was, was probably the, the key moment in my life. And I, was, I really started thinking really, really strongly about safety and didn't want to, did not accept to drive cars that were too, uh, too dangerous. I'm not not safe enough. I mean, dangerous. It's not the right, right word. Not safe enough to to drive. And when I see today, I mean, when I go to the Monaco, the history Grand Prix, or places like that, you see the cars that were built in the seventies and the beginning of the eighties. How fragile this was, and how unsafe these cars have been. And people were driving that at three hundred and, and more kilometers an hour. Today, I mean, nobody would accept to do that. Nobody would accept. But that was the best of the best at that time. So we could not refuse him. So Stefan Beloff was your teammate at Spa in 1985 when he was killed. Tell us a little bit about him and how special he was. Do you think, was he one of the best guys you've ever raced? He was certainly one of the best guys. Certainly one of the best, if not, uh, certainly in the top three, top four. Absolutely. Very impulsive, very, very quick, very, I mean, he had the, the wish to do whatever was necessary to win. We were, we were very good teammates. We started to develop a certain friendship in, in between us, but I had to, first of all, I had a lot of respect for him for what he was doing. I did lots of races against him in Formula 2. When he was winning one, I was winning the next one, he was winning, winning the next one. So that went on and on and on. And in, in uh, we were finally sitting together in the uh, in the group C car, and then we could, I could, I could then see that uh, I was not all that bad because I was uh, matching his times, he was matching mine, and uh, sometimes I, I, I was quicker, and sometimes he was quicker. And I got the car, I uh, qualified the car, and I, had, I was doing better times than, than than him. So we were kind of the same level, and uh, that's where we found this out that the friendship started to to develop and the. It was a huge loss for motorsport, a huge loss for for the world. I think uh, he would have been, he would have, he would have had a chance to become world champion. Seems that so much in your career happened at Spa Francorchamps. You made your Formula One debut there. I did my first international race at Spa Francorchamps. I did. Uh, I took part in a twenty-four hour race in nineteen seventy-seven. That was my first international race. Before that, I was only doing Formula Four, uh, local, local, uh, local place, going to Zolder and going to, uh, to Zandvoort, and that was it. So racing debut, Formula One debut, and then of course there was the tragedy as well with the association with Beloff as well. I mean, there is actually a bit of talk at the minute that is Spa going to stay on the Formula One calendar? Is it going to run every two years? How important do you think? Is Spa to Formula One? For me, there are two events that must stay in the calendar, no matter what. Monaco is one, because of the history, because of legend, because of, of Monaco is Monaco. It's totally unbeatable. Nobody will ever become Monaco or a, a clone of Monaco. This is not possible. The second one is Spa, because it's a most beautiful racetrack in the world by far, and everybody says that. So, why would Formula One not race on on the let's say on, on this legend of Monaco and the most beautiful track? Is it for just for a question of money? I find it very sad if it doesn't happen. Talking of money, how difficult was it for you, um, a young Belgian, to make your way in motorsport to? 
to find the budget to actually get the attention of the Formula One teams, in your case, Arrows? Just describe your journey in the early years. It was not easy because Belgium is a very small country. Country is divided in two. You have the French part on one side, the Flemish part on the other side, and uh, people don't get on very well together. <laughs> Certainly the politics don't get on very well together. I think it was a motivation that got me through all these difficulties uh, and hard work. In the days between the moment I started until I got into Formula One, I was spending over 80% of my time trying to find sponsors and looking for sponsors, and 20% of my time practicing and racing and doing sports to be fit and all that. But 80% was just a pure marketing job. I managed to uh, convince a good group of friends to work with me and to go and look for sponsors and to organize everything around it to make sure that the sponsors were happy, that they were spending some money with the car, with me, and some money in in marketing and advertising on the side to, to make it as a one, one big event. And uh, luckily, I was, I've always been winning races every year in every category that I go for. And there was no other Belgian driver out on, on, uh, on the tracks uh, or to that level anyway uh, at that time. So uh, people helped me in Formula 3, then in Formula 2. Then I managed to find a budget to get into Formula 1. And then what about the move to Arrows? How did that come about? It's a long story. I finished second in the Formula 2 championship, losing the, losing the championship at the very last uh, race with a problem with tyres. And I only finished sixth. I think and I should have finished the top two, five or four two in the championship. Anyway, I got beaten there. And then I found myself without a drive. I didn't want to continue Formula 2 and, and to repeat what, uh, what I had done in the past. I wanted to get into Formula 1. But I had no, uh, no possibility. And uh, I had a call one day from uh, Reinhold Joost. He, he called me and said, well, we are at Monza for the 1,000 kilometers race. This is the very first Group C race for the World Championship, the very first race. I was supposed to have Bob Wallach as a driver and Stefan Johansson as a co-driver, but Stefan has a problem. He cannot come. Would you like to join us? And that was on Thursday. Of the, of the race. I said, sure, sure. My car is already, my engine is already warm and I'm coming. <laughs> so I jumped in my car, went to, went to Monza and I used the, the Friday and the Saturday to get used to the car and to, uh, to, you know, to, to learn how to drive it. It was a, for me, it was a totally new experience. We had the two turbos, we had turbo line, we had not very good brakes on these, in these days there were no carbon brakes. It was just uh, standard brakes. And uh, the fuel consumption, I had to understand how the car was working to be able to do, you know, we had 600 liters to do the whole race. And uh, we had a boost control in the car. We could go up and down with the boost, but we had no idea. There was no, no counter, no fuel counter. So we had no idea how much fuel I had in the car. So it was really great, you know, but I had a very good teacher. Bob Boleg was there and he, he, we got on very, very well together. And he uh, told me what to do and how to drive the car in order to be uh, efficient and not to use too much fuel. So he started the race and I took the second run. He took the third run. And in the end, we won the race with that car in front of the factory. And uh, I think that saved my career. Because after that, I had called from five Formula One teams, uh, remembering what I've done in the past and asking me if I was interested to join them in Formula One. Financially, I had only one possibility. It was I had to go to the cheapest one because I had no, no, no real sponsor behind me at that time. So I went to ours. And uh, it was very, a, a very good school for, for life going to ours, working with Jackie Oliver and his team. And uh, it was a very small team. We didn't have much money. And it, it was just, just a really, really nice experience to work for them. And I stayed there four and a half years. Happy times. One of your teammates, Gerhard Berger. <laughs> Gerhard, uh, a character, both on and off the racetrack, it seems. What was it like being Gerhard Berger's teammate? <laughs> very interesting. <laughs> he was a very funny guy. Very, very funny guy. Very quick. Not interested at all in setting up the car. So he was looking at my settings and putting it on, on his car. But it was nice. Very, very nice. And uh, I was very proud of the fact that uh, 
you know, we, we, we always do a comparison in qualifying who is quicker than the other one. And I won by 13 and hit three. So I was, uh, I was very happy with that. In the races, it was the same, same story. But he, he was also beginning in, in Formula 1 in 1984. So we had a really good time together. Really good time together. Very funny guy. And I uh, enjoyed every moment with him. And we're still, we're still friends. We still talk uh, on a regular basis. And uh, sometimes we work together even, work together. Just like in Formula One, millions of people around the world are looking for their opportunity to make it onto the podium and build on their success. And LinkedIn Jobs is on hand to help you grow your small business and build on your success in the process. The newest member of your team is out there and LinkedIn Jobs has made it easier for you to talk to the people you want to faster than ever. By using LinkedIn Jobs, you can tap into the world's largest professional network with more than 30 million people in the UK. All you need to do is create a post online, which takes just a matter of minutes. Then make sure you tailor your post to reach the right people. And by using their screening questions, you'll be able to zone in on the candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritise who you'd like to interview and hire. And once you're done, don't forget to add the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to let everyone know you're hiring. And then your network can help you spread the word. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster and you can post a job for free. Just visit linkedin.com slash grid. Again, that's linkedin.com slash grid to post a job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Thierry, let's talk a little bit, if we could, about Ligier. It's interesting that you, you had discussions, albeit through Ayrton and Senna, to go to Ferrari, but I'd love your thoughts on what it was like to race for a national team, Ligier being the French national team. Were the pressures different to the other teams you race for? Certainly not. Basically, driving for Ligier was something very... Uh, I had big hopes because Renault asked me to go to Ligier to develop the car, to make sure that the car would be good at the end of the second year that I was there. The first year we had a Lambo engine. The engine was was never powerful. There was big, big difference between engine one and engine two and engine three. You know, like sometimes there were two, two and a half seconds a lap difference between the two engines. Uh, so that was yet to forget. But the year after we had the Renault engine, and uh, I must say that I was very proud to develop that car from being almost an unqualified to being in the top six on the on on uh, on the grid. The car was very unreliable and uh, was not very competitive. But also the, the Ligier was a racing team, yes, but it was not only a racing team. There was a lot of things happening behind the scene on the political side. And uh, it, was, it was never a, a, a very competitive team because it did not have the basis of a real race team. There was no engineering place. There was no, there was an engineering department, engineering department, but only French people working with French people. So the level, level of uh, knowledge had nothing to do compared to, uh, to an English team or to an Italian team. And uh, when Jar Ducarouge joined us, uh, he tried to help that and to make it better, but he also was at the end of his career. So, so he didn't put as much effort in it as uh, he would have done 10 years before. So motivation was missing. Uh, technically, there was a lot of things missing from the engineering side. It was also, you know, so, so, so. We could not have done better than what we did, I think. Uh, and in and, uh, and the end, mistakes that were made and uh, misunderstandings and the lack of confidence in, in one another made it I didn't want to stay there. I always think of Ligier as, as a bit of a missed opportunity just for the team in that they, they did have money. They had the support of the, of the French government. They did have good drivers on their books over the years. They sort of should have had more success, really. Especially at the beginning when they started with Lafitte and the Payet and, and, the, and these guys. And the, uh, it was a, a very good team. And Gerard Ducard was there already so long, long, long time. <laughs> long, long, long time ago. But the, the, the Ligier was not a proper racing team when I joined them. It was a, a mix of uh, poly, French politics and uh, people who were putting pressure on the team had nothing to do with racing, but it was more politics. So 
very difficult to manage and very difficult to understand what was behind it. Uh, did like to show off and, and uh, you know, with all the, these people coming and joining at the races that had nothing to do with racing, but uh, the, the, the heart was missing. You actually finish in the points in your last race for the team in Australia, but how were you feeling about Formula One at this point, at the end of 1992? Well, I was not happy. For sure, not happy about my 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 condition. Not happy about the car that I was driving. Again, the the negative side of being in Belgium, I had no help from anybody financially to put me in a car somewhere. I mean, not like a, a Brazilian a Brazilian would always find a place, or a German will always find a place because the of the marketing behind and because of the opportunities or sponsors and all that. So I was feeling a little bit alone and, and on the side, not finding a way to re-promote myself in the sport. So I did uh, uh, the year after I drove for Jordan. I missed a few few races at the beginning of the year then drove for Jordan. And that again was for me a disaster because the car was too small for me. I couldn't fit in the car. I could not turn the same wheel without hitting the monocoque on one side and my knees on the other side. So it was extremely dangerous. And uh, I was only using 20% of my possibilities in the car. So... I decided to give up and do something else. Going back to uh, endurance races, uh, then I joined Porsche in 1986 and I enjoyed every single race after that until I retired. That's a happy way to end your career, but a frustrating end to your Formula One career. Yes, but I started from nothing and ending up in Formula One with only my own power and being able to stay in Formula One 10 years, doing 164 Grand Prix and finishing fourth in the World Championship in 1988, I think, with the Benetton and being so many times on the rostrums, blah, blah, blah. So, so I was very happy with it, you know. It couldn't have been better. I mean, it was much more than what I expected to start with. So, so although I was a little sad of things happening, I was very happy for, the, for my whole career. Very surprised and very happy. Thierry, it was a wonderful career. And what I find equally extraordinary is that most drivers, when they retire from Formula One, from racing, they slow down, they do a lot of skiing, that kind of thing. They get fat. <laughs> they get fat. <laughs> <laughs> you have not stopped. I mean, boots and aviation, is you're running that from Monaco, but there's there's other businesses as well. I suppose because of all of the, the sponsorship hunting you did, have you always had an interest in business? No, not at all. But I always lived for my passions. My first passion was driving these little motorbikes, going through the woods and the forest with it. That was a really, I was really a passion. Driving race cars was, was a passion. I didn't do it as a business. Maybe it wasn't the right thing to do, but uh, I should have paid more attention to the business side of it, but I enjoyed the racing side of it and the sportive uh, side of it. So that was, uh, that was for me the most important. I had also a passion for aviation, flying airplanes. I mean, I flew my first, Airplane when I was 21 or 22, something like that. And then I bought my first airplane when I was at, uh, at Benetton and I flew the world with it. I went with my turbo prop, I went to Canada, I went to Mexico, and then later I went to uh, even to South Africa with my own airplane with Michele Alboreto next to me in the cockpit. It was so much fun. And uh, when I retired from racing, I had a request from Heinz Alfredson who wanted to buy an airplane to, for his own travels. And he said to me, I want to buy the same plane like the one you have, but I don't know how it happens. How, how can I manage that? So I said, you know, look, I'm going to do it for you as if it was for me. I'm going to find you the plane, get it uh, certified, registered, and find you a pilot. And, uh, and Jeff Hutchinson joined the, joined the, 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 the group, and he was uh, his, first, uh, his first pilot, but it worked very well. And uh, immediately after that, surprisingly, I had a request from KK, who wanted to sell his citation. And then he said to me, Mika, I would like to buy a Learjet. Can you do that for him? I said, sure, yes, no problem. Then Michael, came, Michael Schumacher came to me and I said, he said to me that, well, I've got a Challenger, but I want to sell it because I'm buying a Falcon. Can you sell it for me? I said, sure, no problem. And he said, all of a sudden, I found myself into this, this kind of business that came just as uh, opportunities. And uh, after probably 10 transactions in the racing world. I thought, well, why not go a little bit further than that? And I started to investigate how it was in Germany, in France, in Belgium, in UK, and 
when you know, I had started to deal with the United States as well. So it was 90, from 97 till uh, 99, I think. Since the beginning, now we've sold 405 airplanes in 72 countries. And just as, a, 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 I would not say as a hobby, because it's, it is a hobby, but it's also a professional hobby. And uh, I enjoy every minute of it. What an incredible story. Yeah, it's, but I, I enjoy it. And I do it for the pleasure of, of doing something that I like to do. And, and you obviously stay in touch with racing, if anything, through the planes you're selling to racing people. I did that in the beginning, but then uh, manufacturers came in and they were offering discounts or even planes free of charge for your, for free of charge for the use of it to racing drivers. So I had no more room there. I could not buy or sell airplanes for them. <laughs> that was it. So I was lucky to move out of there and, and go to the rest of the world. And uh, quite, uh, quite interesting uh, business. Terry, you've had a very interesting life. Brilliant Formula One driver great success since then thank you very much for coming on the show you're very welcome Four hundred and five planes in 72 countries that's really impressive but so is everything that Thierry said about his Formula One career the cars he drove and the engineers he worked with and I can't stop thinking about what it must have been like to wheel spin in fifth gear on the approach to Casino Square with that BMW turbo engine unbelievable Formula One certainly was different back then and Thierry also got me thinking about Senna again. Just imagine if he and Ayrton had been teammates at Ferrari. Thierry, it was great to chat. Many thanks for your time. And I look forward to seeing you again soon. Now, as ever, please remember to send in any thoughts and stories that you have on Thierry. Did you see him race in either Formula One or sports cars? Did you see him win? Send in what you've got to Tom Clarkson F1 on Twitter or use the hashtag F1 Beyond the Grid and I'll read out some of your messages next week. Which brings me on to what you sent in about Frank Durney after last week's show. Let's start with this great story from Stin Caverns. We went to Magny Corps once, says Stin. On Saturday evening, we were hanging around the Ligier building and I saw Frank Durney. I asked him if it was possible to visit the factory and he said yes and gave us a private tour. Just imagine that. Stin even sent me a picture from inside the Ligier factory. What a great experience and how very kind of Frank. Let's go next to this from Joshua Barrero. Truly, Frank is a man of a million stories. I would love to hear about how close Alonso was to joining Toyota and the atmosphere around the team during those latter years in the sport. Well, wouldn't it have been good to see Alonso at Toyota? And if he had gone there and been successful, I've got a feeling it would have kept Toyota in the sport. It was a case of what might have been. And finally, let's hear this from Rory Keegan. Frank is a great guy. We met at Hesketh in 1977 and spent the season having a great deal of fun. I enjoyed every minute of it and I'm very pleased that a graduate of the stable block did so, so well. What a lovely message, Rory. Thank you for sending it in. Well, that's almost it for another week. I hope you enjoyed hearing from Thierry and remember to send in your thoughts and stories on him. And why not have a listen to the latest edition of F1 Nation, the sister podcast that I do with Damon Hill and Natalie Pinkham. This week, we've debriefed all about Sunday's Azerbaijan Grand Prix. Thanks for listening. See you back here next week when I'll have another great guest from the world of Formula One. F1 Beyond the Grid is produced by F1 and Audioboom Studios. Until next time, keep it flat out. <laughs>